Hello, sisters. Welcome to our Tuesday night online live Bible study. I'm so glad you've decided to join me this evening. And if you haven't yet said hello in the chat, make sure you do so. Let us know where you're watching from because we want to make sure to say hello to you and let you join in the conversation. Listen, tonight we're talking about rebuilding the walls. Nehemiah rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem around, around Jerusalem in 50 two days, 52 days. And the Lord gave me this word yesterday, radical restoration, radical restoration in 52 days, radical restoration in 52 days. We're talking tonight. We're going to be looking at Nehemiah. We're going to be gleaning some things about how to rebuild the walls around our lives. Okay. Now, sometimes what we can do is we can get overwhelmed because we can look around and we can think this has been this way for a really long time, right? Like, like this has been something that's been broken down in our lives for a really long time, maybe through neglect, maybe through abandonment, maybe through um, just, you know, enemy coming in and breaking things apart. There can be a lot of different reasons that the walls around our life can be broken down. And sometimes, it can go on for years and years, and then we can get overwhelmed and feel like, I don't even want to deal with that. I don't even want to look at it. I don't even want to uh, to really give too much time and attention to it because I'm afraid if I get into this thing, it's going to take a really long time. Like the, the question I was asking tonight, if you've ever gotten into a remodeling project, re refurbishing something or restoring something, could be furniture or something else, it usually takes longer way longer than what we at first anticipated, right? But Nehemiah, because of the wisdom of God and the Holy Spirit, the good hand of the Lord being upon him, what should have taken several years, couple of years, at least a year, okay? By any, uh, with rudimentary tools and all that, that they didn't have all the modern technology that we have today, what should have taken that long took 52 days. And think about it. They also took breaks for Sabbath. Okay, that's not even two months. And I heard the Lord say, if we, if you'll listen in tonight, the Lord's saying radical restoration in 52 days. If we will follow the wisdom from Nehemiah, God is saying he promises that he can bring radical restoration into the walls that are broken down in our lives in 52 days. And I don't know about you, but that's pretty inviting when I start thinking about how impossible some situations may seem. Okay, so uh, anyways, we're in for a good, good study tonight. Radical restoration in 52 days is possible with God. Hallelujah. Okay, so I was asking you girls just in our warm up question, have you ever been involved with remodeling or refurbishing or restoring something? Okay, now I've only ever, I've never been involved in a remodeling project. I've heard about a lot of remodeling projects but never actually been involved in one. Um, but what I have, if I've, I've re, uh, what do you call that? Restored old furniture. And um, I don't know, I, I love restored old furniture. I don't know if any of you can, and can, um, can, uh, you know, relate to that, but I love restored old furniture, just absolutely gorgeous. And for a season, I was doing that. I was restoring furniture and then I take it down to like a, you know, a secondhand shop and, and I would sell it. But my goodness, it was so much work. I mean, I was working for like a buck an hour. <laughs> okay. I mean, that's how much work it was. It was, it ended up being something that really wasn't worth all the effort, even though I love the outcome. It was way beyond my ability to keep up with something like that. So Adeline said that uh, she did, that they did a project in their church, okay, a few years back. And she remembers um, it took about a year altogether, so she thinks. And uh, she said that they did new, new windows, carpets, new chairs painted, and a few other things. Yeah, that sounds like a pretty major remodeling uh, project. Susan said that she had a house built in Prunedale. Oh my goodness. And they were involved in every step. So you've got uh, some serious um, 
experience with uh, remodeling right there, or not even remodeling, but but building, just building something from the ground up. Yeah, that's a major, major project right there. But how wonderful to be able to build your own home, even with, I'm sure with all of the challenges and everything that it came with, the outcome I'm sure was well worth it. Hi, Melissa from New York. <laughs> We're glad you're with us tonight. And um, hi, Night Angel. I can't remember. I think you said, I think your name is Lourdes, if I remember correctly. Correct me if I'm wrong or if I'm right, let me know in, in the chat. Uh, let's see. Letty said her and Ruben repurposed an oversized toy box they got for free on Craigslist. They rep repurposed it into a kitchen island. Just got it finished. Today. Oh, how gorgeous. How beautiful is that? You're going to have to share a picture of that in the community group. That's one of the blessings about the community group is that we can do that. We can actually share pictures. Um, let's see. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so uh, Adeline saying the same thing. Okay, so Mimi is in the middle of doing some major remodeling right now. I know she said over the, I think it was over the weekend, she finished painting uh, her room, which is pretty significant. Um, also a hobby, redoing a chair, bought at a thrift store that will probably be done in about a month, right? It takes longer than maybe what we would like, but you know, it can be worth it if you're willing to put in the effort. Um, hi, Heather, glad you're with us tonight, sister. And uh, let's see, what else do we have? Mrs. Wilson, glad you're with us tonight. And uh, let me see, Heather, I just wanted to share a few of these because this kind of gets us warmed up for where we're going tonight. Um, let's see. Going to be extremely busy through Monday. Prayers needed. This is what Heather's saying. Got some tasks that need to be finished by Monday. Okay. Well, you've got, what, six days now. Time is ticking. <laughs> okay. So Julia says, she's watching from Southern Illinois. Welcome, Julia. We're glad you're with us tonight. Julia is watching on Facebook, so you won't see her in the YouTube chat area. Um, she says her son and his wife are putting in an offer on an older home, and I'm hoping to help my daughter, daughter-in-law, redo the attic if they do buy the house. That sounds exciting. Please keep them in your prayers. Will do. Absolutely. They've been house hunting for over a year. Wow. They're ready to settle down for sure. Amen. Okay. Um, let's see. Okay. So Mrs. Wilson said the closest would be we are currently building our dream home. <laughs> It'll be completed in the fall. Seems like forever. That's pretty major. Yes, that's huge. How wonderful is that? I bet you there's a God story behind that. Amen. Let's go ahead and pray for uh, Julia's family right now. Um, Father, we just want to say, yes, Lord, let the favor of your hand, your good hand, oh God, be upon her son and daughter-in-law. And Lord, if this is the house for them, Lord, we pray you open the doors wide, that you move before them and go behind them. I pray that the stress level is low and the excitement is high. I pray, God, that you get them in in a situation that's better than what they anticipated or expected, Lord. We just speak the name of Jesus over every aspect of this and wherever the enemy would try to get in and cause frustration or sabotage or plans, Lord, we just bind those right now in Jesus' name, and we ask for your favor to be released in that circumstance. Hallelujah. And Lord, be with Mrs. Wilson and her husband as they are waiting and um, working for the building of their dream home. Lord, we're excited with them. We know there's a God-sized story there, so thank you for that, Lord, and we just pray the, hen the enemy's hands are off of it in Jesus' name. And we have Nicole Chantel. Hello, Lisa. Hi, Nicole. Watching from Orlando, Florida. Hi, sister. I'm glad you're with us tonight. And um, and I believe this is Nicole, right? I can't see with my without my glasses on, but I believe this is Nicole from who I knew when I was, uh, or when you were little, not when I was little, but I was pretty young. <laughs> pretty young then. That was a while ago. <laughs> okay. We have Anne from Melbourne and Elena from Southern California. Welcome sisters. And uh, Princess Madeira 
says tonight she did re she did a remodel at a family dollar it was supposed to be two weeks took 10 days that's amazing they were getting freezers installed and it had to add a cooler foods drinks and so forth she said it was fun what an experience how huh? you learn a lot from doing stuff like that praise god she says it was beautiful it was her first job when she moved to connecticut hallelujah <laughs> okay all righty well thanks so much for sharing uh your stories if you haven't done so we would still love to hear it so let us know um whoops what did i do with that one there we go okay hey tonight I also want to let you know, we have something a little bit fun tonight, okay? I am going to be giving away, wait for it. <laughs> okay, what do we have here? This is a, a printable sticker sheet, okay? My, um, my word for this year is the word excellent, okay? Whoops, let me see. I got to pull that back off. Let me pull it back down. My word for this year is the word excellent. Okay. So over the weekend, you know, every so often I, I have my little creative streak where I like to um, do something super creative and um, I'll create these little sticker sheets that are printable for your prayer planners or your Bible study planners or just your planner or whatever you want to use it for. Right. Um, anyways, I'm going to give away one of those tonight. So here's how you're going to, here's how you're going to participate. We're going to do a drawing at the end tonight. And um, let me see if I can get my mouse over here. Oh, no, that's right. I'm going to this spot. Sorry. This is what you're going to do. Let me put it up here like this. You're going to, you are going to write in the chat, hashtag excellent, hashtag excellent. Okay. And at the end of tonight, I'm going to do a drawing. StreamYard is going to going to pick a name. They're going to do a random drawing for us. Okay. And, um, and whoever wins, I will, uh, email you that you're going to email me first. So I know who you are. And then I'm going to send the uh, downloadable printer sheet for you. It's actually two pages and they are cute. In fact, if you're watching on YouTube, you can see, um, it in the description down there. They just turned out so cute. I can't wait to put it in. I was printing mine off this afternoon. I was, that's, <laughs> I was got a little distracted with that earlier, but, um, Anyways, I'm super excited about using that. So the theme verse is Proverbs 29, I'm sorry, Proverbs 30, 31, 29. And um, my daughters, my daughter, you excel above them all. And so that's one of my theme verses. Just having this excellent, really it's this idea of having an excellent spirit and excelling in this season. And so that's um, coming out of just my own uh, inspiration, but I want to bless some people with it to share with that too. So anyways, let me take this off if I can. Oh, I see where am I at here. Okay. There we go. Okay. We're going to open with a word of prayer tonight. And as always, if you do have prayer requests, you can always leave them in the comments. And before we get, um, before we get, what was I going to say? Before we get into the word, we're going to pray. But at the end tonight, after everything is done, I always go back through the comments and make sure if there's any prayer requests that I cover those in prayer, but also everyone else does too. Okay, so Julia is asking, how can I get to the community group to watch your lives? Okay, so you're going over to Lisa Cook. If you're talking about um, the lives for what we're doing, or are you talking about the lives in the community group? So that's, you go through the Excel workshop. If you've, I have, I don't know if you, did you register for that, Julia? I can't remember offhand. Um, so if you did register for it, it's actually, um, I've sent out some emails with the link for you to join the community group. Okay. Otherwise you would need to email me again and I can send that to you if you can't find it. Okay. So if that's what you're asking, you'll have to get more clear. I'm, I'm just assuming that that's what you're talking about. So anybody who's registered for the Excel vision and goal setting workshop, you get a link for the community group because that's part of what we're doing anyway. So, okay, so let's go ahead and get into the word and um, or prayer, I should say. And then we're going to begin our study, which is, oops, let me go all the way back here. What happened here? Sorry about that. See, I'm going to have trouble with uh, some of my stuff I can see. Oh, there we go. Is that correct? Oh, yeah, that's correct. Sorry. 
Okay. <laughs> you guys will have to be patient with me. <laughs> okay, let's go ahead and pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to get into your word. And I thank you, Lord, for this word that you dropped in my heart just yesterday, and then we're adding to it today. And um, Lord, you you just amaze me. You amaze me because you want to do the kind of work in our lives, Lord, that only you can do. Only you can do. And you are a passionate lover of our souls and you want us to thrive. You don't want us just to settle in the lowest places, God. You want us to thrive. You want the walls of our life to be rebuilt. So I pray, Lord, you highlight your wisdom tonight. Show us, God, what is possible by the power of the Holy Spirit when we cooperate with you. And I ask God that your word would come alive to us tonight. In Jesus' mighty name, I pray. Amen and amen. Okay. So yeah, you said, no, you're not talking about the live videos like tonight. You're talking about the lives in the community group. So um, did you, so you can answer this question. Did you, um, did you enroll in the Excel 2023 vision and goal setting workshop? If you answer yes to that, then um, we'll have to connect so that I can um, get you the link for that. I'll make sure to send, resend that to you. If you haven't enrolled, that's what you have to do in order to get the link for the community group. Okay. Hopefully that makes sense. <laughs> okay. All right. So girls, you're going to turn in your Bibles to Nehemiah chapter two. Um, we are continuing. We've been in this study. So what are we talking about tonight? We're talking about radical restoration in 52 days. Okay. Rebuilding the walls of your life. Now I've been watching and you can let me know in the chat if any of you have been watching this or you have watched this. Maybe it's old news for you. But I've been watching uh, Fixer Upper, their newest, I think it's their newest episode on remodeling the castle. Okay. <laughs> I love to watch remodel, you know, people remodel things. And this is um, this has been an incredible um, episode where they're, where they're restoring this hundred year old castle. Okay. And the last that I saw, they were like at day, I haven't finished watching the whole series. I'm not sure how many episodes there are, but they were like 200 and something. Okay. And, uh, and so it was taking, I guess, close to a year, if not a year for them to complete this renovation on a 100 year old castle. Princess Madeira says, yes, she loves HDTV. Me too. <laughs> Amen. Um, and so there, it's taken a year for them to do this. With Think about it with all the modern technology and um, all the modern gadgets that we have. It still took them a year to restore this castle. And no doubt they, you know, they went above and beyond and they did it beautifully. But listen, Nehemiah took a two and a half mile long wall. And they worked it and restored it in 52 days. Now, I want to show you this. Um, here's a picture of this. Let me see if I can enlarge this for a minute. Okay. So here you have the wall. This is uh, this is what um, archaeologists have discovered. It, it was shaped different in this time during Nehemiah's time. And... Um, it's two and a half miles all the way around Jerusalem. Okay, that's what was broken down. That is what they were restoring. Okay, and this, and here's a here's another one um, that you can see. This is like, I think somebody made like a little handmade model of it so that it kind of brings it to life. Um, let me see if I can enlarge that one too. Okay, there you go. And so two, just think about this, two and a half miles all the way around. And there's 10 gates. It has 10 gates. Okay. Now in the book of revelations, there's 12 gates, but here they mention Nehemiah mentions in his writing, he mentions 10 gates. Okay. And so you think about it in, in 52 days, this is an amazing feat. I mean, just an amazing feat that they would be able to, um, repair this, it says approximately um, the, the territory was like 220 acres, okay? And the circumference of the wall that surrounded that territory was two and a half miles. This is amazing, okay? This is amazing. And um, 
And so here's what the Lord is saying to us tonight. Okay, he wants the walls of our life to be rebuilt. And he's going to offer us a challenge. And we're going to see why this is going to be possible with the Holy Spirit. Okay, because one of the things that the Lord was showing me is that the Holy Spirit, that when you look at Nehemiah, Nehemiah is a type of Holy Spirit in this particular instance. Okay. And here's why I say that. And, and I just, when I was praying into this today, this is what the Lord dropped in my spirit. Okay. So um, a type just means that you can learn about through looking at Nehemiah in the Old Testament, in this particular aspect of his ministry, you can, you can gauge the heart of God and even the activity of God. Okay. Um, or I'm sorry, the, the heart and the activity of the Holy Spirit by looking at Nehemiah. Okay, so the reason why I say this, though, is the Lord was showing me that the Holy Spirit right now, this very moment, is grieving over the walls that are broken down in our lives. He's grieving over that. Okay, this is something that he longs to repair. This is something that he longs to restore. He wants us living a vibrant, healthy, thriving, Christ-centered life, okay? This is what he wants for every one of his sons and daughters. And so when there are places in our life that are in shambles or in rubble or in disrepair or broken down in different areas of our life, when there are those places, the Holy Spirit yearns over that for its repair, for its rebuilding, for its restoration. Why? Because he wants the glory of Christ to be evident through our lives. He wants us living healthy lives, the abundant life that Christ purchased for us. Okay. And so not only, but here's the beautiful part about this. It's not that he's just yearning. It's not that he's just grieving. But see, the reason is, is because he knows that he has all the resources. Now think about this. Nehemiah grieved over the walls of Jerusalem being broken down. Nehemiah began to dream and have a vision of those walls being restored and rebuilt. And then Nehemiah went before the king and Nehemiah was funded, resourced by the king to rebuild those walls around Jerusalem. And here's what the Lord wants us to remember, that Holy Spirit has access to all the resources of the kingdom to rebuild the lives. I mean, to rebuild the walls around our lives, to rebuild those walls so that they're hardy, so that they're, they're strong, so that they can withstand the attacks of the enemy. Because remember, in those days, the walls were very, very significant in their protection. They kept the bad things out and the good things in, okay? And this is God's desire for us. We are to be living a sanctified, set-apart life, not that we're, we're just, um, you know, living uh, isolated lives from the rest of the world. Of course, we understand that's not what that means, especially under the new covenant. We're to be in the world, but not of the world, right? And so we're living these lives that are to be sanctified, set-apart, but also those walls represent strength. Okay. And they represent security. Okay. So the Lord says, I want the, the walls of your life to be strong and I want you to be secure and I want you to, to um, have your identity in him reinforced. And so those walls represent all of those things. Okay. And so here we have this beautiful picture through Nehemiah, a heart, a God's heart yearning for our walls to be rebuilt. God's desire uh, that he longs to be able to, to restore those, to partner with us to restore them. Because remember, it was going to require all the people to be involved, everyone working their part, right? And then he says, listen, all the resources of the kingdom are there to fund it, to resource it, to make it happen. Okay, so there's just some things that he needs from us. And this is what we're looking at tonight. So I just want to set the stage for that. What does it mean really to have the walls of your life broken down? You know, it can mean a lot of different things. It And it's kind of taking this inventory. And so we're going to talk about this tonight. But, you know, there's a lot of things that happen in life. And this is not a one-time deal, is it? It's not like we get it all fixed up and it never needs repair again. No, 
because we're constantly having to deal with the things that are going on in the world in search circumstances and situations, everything from heartbreaks to, um, to losses, to uh, frustrations, to um, onslaught attacks of the enemy, to, uh, I mean, just all kinds of stuff. So the walls of our life represent all of the different relationships and roles and, and responsibilities and callings. It, it can include your finances, your marriage, your relationship with your children, your, your career, your ministry. I mean, these are all representative of the walls of our life, okay? And also, of course, the spiritual walls being our relationship with God, okay? So I want to begin by reading to you, because we've been looking, you know, we looked at uh, Nehemiah chapter one, now we're in Nehemiah chapter two, but I want to begin by reading verses 11. This is Nehemiah two verses 11 through, I believe 14. Yes. Okay. It says, so I came, <clears throat> this is Nehemiah writing. He says, so I came to Jerusalem and was there three days. When I arose in the night, I and a few men with me, I told no one what my God had put in my heart to do at Jerusalem. Nor was there any animal with me except the one on which I rode. Verse 13. And I went out by night through the valley gate to the serpent wall and the refuse gate, and I viewed the walls of Jerusalem, which were broken down and its gates were burned with fire. Then I went on to the fountain gate and to the king's pool, but there was no room for the animal under me to pass. Okay, so the first thing I want us to see, and let me just, um, let me do it like this, okay? The first thing I want us to see, and I'm going to pull this up so that I can see it too, is that ne Nehemiah surveyed the walls. Okay, so he shows up in Jerusalem after he had gotten his papers and he had gotten permission, right? That was the first stage of his journey. He, and this is so important, I mentioned this last week, sometimes you can't plan out, many times you can't plan out the whole thing that God is calling you to do um, at one time. So what you do is you do what you can with what you've got, you begin, you begin taking steps of faith in that, out in that, okay? And then as you're going, the way will be made more clear. So this is exactly what Nehemiah did. He did what he could with what he had. He shows up in Jerusalem, but listen, before he does anything, he surveys the walls. He, he goes out by night and he takes a walk around the walls. He, he rides a donkey. There are certain parts that are so broken down, so torn up, such uh, destruction of rubble. He can't even pass through on his donkey. He has to go by foot. But this, this was the first thing that I felt like the Lord wanted us to um, take note of. We, before we can, we can really get into a thorough restoration project. And here's what the Lord is saying. He's saying to us radical restoration in 52 days. Okay. He wants us to experience, he wants us to have hope that this, that this project that God is saying to restore, there may be some part of your life where you're like, I just, it's just in such rubble. It's in such disrespair. It, I've had so much frustration with it. Okay. I, I keep getting set back with it. It keeps holding me up. I keep tripping over it. Whatever it is, the Lord is saying, listen, it can, it can happen a lot sooner than you think. Okay. So sometimes we, we get so overwhelmed. We just want to, we just want to ignore it. We want to, to be honest, sometimes we just want to stick our head in the sand like an ostrich and ignore these parts of our life because we're so frustrated or they seem so overwhelming. Okay. Or they seem like they're just going to require years of work. Okay. But the Lord is saying, no, listen very carefully. He says, no, he says he can do radical restoration in 52 days. What might be humanly possible is possible with God. Okay. And so, but the first thing you have to do is you have to survey your walls. Okay. Now this gets a little bit um, challenging. Okay, so before we can rebuild and restore, you have to have a good assessment of the condition of your walls. You have to be willing to take that walk with the Lord. Okay, survey the walls of your life with the Lord. You have to be willing to take that walk and begin to assess the different areas of your life. You know, in our uh, in that 
vision and goal setting workshop. The first portion of that, like I think it's like uh, session two, well, session two, three, four, and maybe even session five. Um, that's exactly what we do. Okay. We, we dig in a little deep to really survey the walls of our life. Don't use exactly that terminology. It's called one of the one of the sessions is called um, assessing the areas of your life. Okay, where you begin to go through and you begin to honestly, in the presence of God, you begin to look and say, okay, honestly, if I look at my relationship with God on a scale of one to ten, is it is it closer to a one or is it closer to a ten? Okay, if I look at my marriage on a scale of one to ten. Okay, is it closer to a one or is it closer to it? You know, you see what I'm saying? You begin going through every area of your life before God. And I believe that we all should be doing this at least once a year. Okay, and this takes being very intentional. Okay, because listen, you and I cannot see a lot of times people are trying to set goals for their life based on the fruit instead of the root. Okay, this is really important to get because many times what happens is there's a disconnect between the two. So we're trying to deal with the fruit. So we set a goal that that is dealing with the fruit instead of looking to the root. And so when you assess the walls of your life, the Lord can begin to expose things to you that really, if those were taken care of, it would deal with the other extremities. Okay. So for instance, um, let's just say your finances. Okay. So sometimes people are really focused and they think, my goodness, you know, I just need to make more money. And that may be true. Okay. But usually the, the problem lies at something deeper. Okay. Usually if you really get in there, you can begin to say, okay, well, maybe the problem isn't totally that I need to make more money. Maybe it's not me. Maybe I'm not handling the money I have well, or maybe like, you know, when I was growing up, my parents, um, the only argument they ever had that I remember them having, and they had it all the time was about finances. Okay. And the, and the arguments would really heat up. And then my mom would get to a boiling point and she would threaten to divorce my dad. And as a kid, that was so scary. Okay. But here's the thing. They did not have a financial problem. They did not. And and yet that was the thing that they argued about all the time. But see, my dad would go out and he would spend money and he wouldn't tell my mom about it. And um, and then he would just want her to kind of work magic in the checkbook at the end of the month, you know, and make it all work together. And she would just feel overwhelmed and frustrated. But see, they didn't have a, they, they made enough money to do fairly well. They weren't wealthy, but they were, you know, they were like probably, um, middle class, I would say. Okay. And so they had enough money to do well. Okay. But they always were running short, but they didn't have a financial problem. They really had for my dad. It was, it was a relational problem, but also he was trying to, um, salve a, a, a really a hole that he had. Okay. By trying to buy things. Okay. You know, and that's sometimes what happens because he didn't have a relationship with the Lord. And so When you begin to survey the walls, God can begin to expose these kinds of things that help you see how these pieces fit together, okay? I hope that makes sense, okay? Because um, what you want is you you want to allow the Lord to help you assess the walls of your life so that you can set the right goals so that you can get the right kind of outcome. Instead of just trying to run around, put out fires, you know what I'm saying? And so when, when we're doing this in a disconnected way, we never really make progress in the things that are most important. And so what can happen though, sometimes you go through this assessment and you start to feel overwhelmed, like, oh my goodness, practically every area needs growth. Well, you're always going to need growth in every, just about every area. We're never going to arrive and that's okay. This is a walk of grace. But here's what we want to do is we want to begin looking to what is most important in this season. Because once you hit the foundation of things, once you begin to build upon the things that are most important, those things can affect the other things. And the other things are going to be much easier to fix once you get these primary things fixed. Okay. Okay. So we have Nehemiah surveys the walls and we need to intentionally take time to let the Lord help us survey our own walls. And and this kind of ties into the second part. I want you to see Nehemiah 
did not do it. I'm sorry, Nehemiah. Yeah, he didn't do it with other people. He did it alone. Okay, he did it alone. This is really important because if you look here, he says, I told no one what my God had put in my heart to do. Okay, and then a little bit later, it says, um, so I, I think it was verse uh, 15. So I went up in the night by the valley and viewed the wall. Then I turned back and entered the valley gate and so returned. And the officials did not know where I had gone or what I had done. I had not yet told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials or the others who did the work. Okay. So here's what he does. And this is something that we can learn from Nehemiah, both in rebuilding the walls of our lives, but also when you are preparing to step out in a vision, okay, that God has entrusted to you to move out in, okay, there's, there's a lot of wisdom right here. Because first of all, if you're dealing with just the, when you're dealing with the walls of your life, which are the most important thing, because everything else is going to come from that. Okay. So when you're dealing with that, this is, I'm telling you, this is a job that has to happen between you and God. It's the Lord who needs to give you that revelation. This is not something that you get to just go to a group and try to get fixed. Okay. You have to get honest before the Lord and let him bring the revelation that you need, even if it's hard, even if it's hard revelation. Okay. And sometimes we get a little scared because we're thinking I, and I know this because there's times when I've gone through stuff where I thought, I don't even want, like, I don't even want to deal with that. Right. Like, I don't even want, I don't even want to look at that. Cause I'm thinking it's going to be so hard. But every time I do that, the Lord always shows me it's not going to be as hard as you think. If you really honestly look at it, because the bulk of the weight is going to be on the shoulders of the Holy Spirit, because what he does is he pinpoints the area, even in that area that like, we're thinking this thing is so huge. I don't even want to try to deal with it, Lord. But the Lord says, just let me show you the one thing in that, that is going to make the rest of it so much simpler. Okay. So many times we're afraid, but it's because we're overwhelmed by it. Right. And whenever you're overwhelmed, you feel paralyzed. Right. And so the Lord would want to take that out of the way and say, don't be afraid. Don't be scared. He says, I want to expose where the enemy has brought destruction in the walls of your life so that we can rebuild strong walls because you will, you and I will never be all that God intended us to be without us having those walls strong and sturdy. Okay. Because that's part, like I said, of our protection, it keeps the wrong things out and lets the right things in. That's what those gates are about. Opening the gates to the right things. Okay, but keeping those walls up to protect us from the wrong things. Okay, and the Lord says, I want you to have healthy walls, healthy walls in every area of your life. I want there to be health. Now that could be boundaries. That includes that. But right now we're talking about building, right? We're talking about building something healthy, building some, some, um, some solid things in our life. Okay, not things that are just all broken down and barely operating, right? <laughs> Or that, that, you know, are just in, uh, in shambles or in rebels. Okay. So we didn't do it alone. And, um, okay. And so then the other part of this that I thought was, in, uh, would be important to mention too, and this is, this is connected, but in a little different way. Okay. So if the Lord has entrusted you with a, a vision to accomplish something and you go through this process of, seeking the Lord and wanting to begin to establish like, what exactly is this? Okay. And we'll talk more about that in just a minute. But, but one of the things that needs to happen is you need to process that with God before you start trying to share the vision with other people. Okay. And part of the reason for that is you need to be clear You've got to get some clarity and confidence and assurance before you step out and start sharing it with others. And that's what he does. He assesses those walls on his own by himself so that he can process it, no doubt with the Lord, so that he can have a plan and a sense of vision. You don't just jump into a, a remodeling project, you know, like a contractor doesn't just say, oh yeah, I'm going to do it sight unseen, right? No, he's going to go out and survey the area. 
right? In, in uh, the fixer upper that I was mentioning earlier, you know, their first, the first part of every project they do, they always show them walking through the home, right? And assessing things like what's going to need to be done, really starting to get a vision for what they want to happen. And this is the same thing in our lives. But this is something you need to do not with a group of people, but something you need to do with God. So a number of years ago, um, actually, when this ministry started, before it began, about a year and a half before it began, the Lord began moving in my heart to um, step out of my church. I had been ministering to women in my church for a really long time. And, um, but I just felt this, I, I can't explain it other than the Lord was just like, there was this unction on me that I needed to go outside of my church walls, but I wasn't sure what that was supposed to look like. And so I just began trying different things. And so at one point I went on this mission trip to Mexico. It was like this little mission trip. And I went with a, a small group of, um, of other believers. In fact, I took our, our youngest son with us and, uh, oh my goodness, we saw so much poverty. Okay. So much poverty, so much, um, just lack. And we went and we visited several orphanages and we brought food and we brought some supplies and that kind of thing. But I remember one day, cause I'm, I was there and part of me was there. Okay, Lord, I'm, I'm waiting for you to bring some revelation about what it is. Where is it you want me to invest in that's outside of the church? And here I am in Mexico. I don't speak the language. I can't communicate with anyone. And I don't feel like I can contribute anything really other than my prayers. So I'm standing there and I'll never forget. I don't remember where I was exactly. I just know I was on a dirt driveway. The sun was going down. And I was talking to the Lord about this. I said, here we are, Lord. And I just see such poverty. And the Lord spoke really clearly to my heart. And he said, Lisa, he said that the poverty that you see in the physical is the same poverty that people have spiritually everywhere. Okay. And, um, and I just heard him say, and I've heard him say this a million times, well, thousands of times since then, he said, feed my sheep. And I knew what he was saying. He was saying, your, your place was not to be in ministry in Mexico. I couldn't, I couldn't communicate there. But he was saying, what I want you to do is I want you to take what you do, what, what I've given you to do, and to feed my sheep. And I, I, I wasn't, still wasn't clear, like, how was that supposed to look? But it began something. And I really began to pray into that for a number of weeks. And the Lord crystallized for me a vision of going outside of our church walls and hosting events for women to be able to come to from different churches. And, um, and he just said, just do what you love, like minister the word. I said, I love to hear testimonies. So we had people share testimonies. I, I love to worship. So I wanted there to be extended worship. And that was basically it. Hold these events and do this. And before I before I shared that vision with a group of about 10 women, I got crystal clear. Like I wrote the thing out. I took time to, you know, in a sense, survey the walls, get a feel for what was going to be necessary to accomplish this thing, put it all in writing. And then I gathered a group strategically of women that I felt like needed to be there at that meeting. And there was like 10 women there. And I think half of them said yes. The other half were very supportive, but they just weren't at a place that they could really, you know, be super involved. So that was so important. That was such a huge part of that process. And we went on to do events for several years. But here's the thing. Sometimes people try to go and share the vision, okay, before they've, they've gotten clear about what the vision is before what it is they actually want to accomplish because other people can't get involved until you've gotten a lot of clarity. So that, I just wanted to share that because that is a huge part, I think, of um, when God has put something in your heart to do, you've got to take time to get clear. But the same is true when we're talking about rebuilding the walls of our lives. We've got to get clarity about what it is that needs to happen. Like, what areas of my life actually need to be fortified? What areas of my life need to be rebuilt? What areas of my life are failing right now, are not really in, 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 um, in the place that they should be or they ought to be according to what I've been given in Christ? And so we need to be able to take time to do that. Now, the next one I want to I wanna point out is that here's the thing. Nehemiah, number one, he had a big vision. 
And I want you to know, God has a big vision for your life. Okay, Psalms 139, right? Psalms 139, I wrote out the passage. It says, your eyes saw my unformed body all the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Okay, God had a vision for your life before you were even born. Okay, he has a vision. He has a big vision for your life. It's a comprehensive vision. It involves all the different areas of your life. It involves, yes, your relationship with him, of course. It revolves your relationship if you're married with your spouse. It revolves your, involves your relationship with your children. It involves your relationship with your grandchildren. It involves your relationship with ministry. It involves your relationship with your community. It involves all of these things as part of God's big vision. It's a comprehensive vision. So sometimes when I talk about vision, all people are hearing is like, God's calling me to do this thing. Well, his vision for your life is, is not just about some thing that you're going to do. That may be part of it. I don't doubt that God has put something significant in your heart to do, okay? But God has a comprehensive vision for your life. And I want you to understand, see, Nehemiah had this big vision, right, for rebuilding the walls around Jerusalem. He didn't even live there, <laughs> okay? He didn't even live there. And he wasn't going to be living there long term. Okay. He was in a place. He had a privileged position serving the king. It was kind of risky, but he still had one. Okay. He was well taken care of, no doubt. He lived far away from Jerusalem. But see, when God began to minister to him, when he when when the thing began to get a hold of his heart, he saw how those walls were significant to the kingdom of God, okay? The, the glory of Israel, the glory of Jerusalem, the holy city of God. And so his vision wasn't just about himself. His vision was connected to the bigger plan of redemption of God. And see, this is what I want us to realize is our lives, God has a big vision for our lives. And it's because our lives are connected to his redemption, to his redemption story. You see what I'm saying? And if we miss that, here's what can happen. We start, like if you set a goal, you often will give up on that goal. You get discouraged and give up on it because you don't see how it's connected to God's big vision for your life how your life is connected to the overall re a story of redemption that God has for humanity. Our lives are meant to impact the lives of others in such a way that God's story continues through them. And so sometimes what we don't do is we don't make that kind of a connection. And so we set a goal, okay, that it can be a good goal. But because we've never actually taken time to assess our walls and get clear and, and actually set goals out of the bigger vision that God has for us, we don't see that. And then, and then it begins to break down after a while. But if you understand, like, you know what, like I have a goal of getting healthy, that's great. But how is that connected to God's big redemption story? Well, it, it, I can tell you it is. Because God wants you to have the energy, the vitality, the strength, the um, what, what you're going to need to actually do the things that God has called you to do, right? But if it's just about getting healthy, okay, and it's not connected to the bigger vision God has for your life, you might be excited about it for a while, but after two or three months, you're going to drop the ball because you don't see how it's connected. Okay, I hope that makes sense. Okay, so I want you to know God has a big vision for your life and he wants us to seek his heart for that. In fact, in, in this vision and goal setting workshop, one of the first things we do is we look at like the end of our life. How do I want to be remembered? This is a good question to ask yourself. How do I want to be remembered by my family, my friends, my relatives? Because you have to be super intentional about those things. This is how we start to get the mind of Christ for our lives, the bigger vision, not just a now vision, but like I'm investing now, I'm going to live redemptively now because there's a much bigger picture that's being worked out, okay? And then the next part is clear goals. 
I want you to notice he had this big vision, right? Rebuilding the walls around. That's a big vision. Two and a half miles worth of wall. Okay. But he had a clear goal. What was it? <laughs> it was rebuilding the wall. Now he had the bigger vision of it wasn't just the wall, but it was um, to help the people. It was to help to secure them. It was to help to elevate them. It was to help to remove the rubble and the disgrace that they were living under. He wanted to restore them as this, you know, this glorious city of God. He wanted to help bring that because from a distance, that's what you see. You see those gorgeous walls elevated around Jerusalem. That's what people would see. Okay. But he had one very specific goal, and that was to rebuild the wall. Now, this is important because sometimes what happens, we can assess the walls and then we go, okay, but now I've got like five goals that I want to try to com complete, okay? Where, as I'm saying, listen, one of the ways that God, I believe, would challenge us is to really get things focused to like one goal. You can do one, two. I always say never do more than three. But I'm going to say this because I really felt like the Lord was saying this to me today. If you will think about radical restoration in 52 days. So instead of three goals for the year, you say, I'm going to focus on one for 52 days. And then I'll focus on another for 52 days. Now, it doesn't have to be this number, okay? But this is a number, okay? And it worked here. And I believe the Holy Spirit will make it work for you too. But you have to get so focused. You have to get focused and clear. What is the one goal? And then you have to be committed to actually walking that out every day with God so that that thing can really get flipped around. And you're not just going forward and coming back, going forward and coming back, right? And so we had one goal. And see, the focus of this is so powerful because oftentimes what happens, we're not clear about the goal. We're not clear about how it's connected to this bigger vision. And so we end up pittering our time away on a bunch of things that honestly are not very valuable. Okay. And so we get distracted and I, I can relate because I've done it myself. We get distracted with this. We get distracted with that. But when our focus is super clear and I'm like, I am going after this one goal and we realize it doesn't, it's not like it's going to take you all day or anything like that, but you're just like every day, I'm going to be super intentional about investing into this one goal. I am going with the partnership of the Holy Spirit and the strength of the Lord. I'm going to seek and, and go after this radical restoration where every day for 52 days, I'm going to focus on one thing, not five things, not 10 things, you know, not, not getting distracted with 20 different things, which we can do. We live in a very distracted world, but the Lord is saying the power of focus, okay, allowing the Holy Spirit to help you focus in on the one thing, the one thing. And then you get super clear because you're not, you're not thinking about, um, Oh, well, maybe this is part of it. And maybe this is, you know, how, you know, we can do that. Like, like, like there's one primary thing, but we keep getting distracted with things that are connected to it instead of actually focusing on that one thing. Okay. And then we can make all these excuses in our mind. That's why I think it's super important to stay. And that this is the primary reason that they had so much um, success in getting this thing done is because it got down to one thing. Now, I also wanted to mention this. When that goal is connected to a comprehensive vis vision, it's going to provide the right kind of motivation, passion, and perseverance, okay? And um, if and I do believe if we will decide one thing and be consistent and faithful, we're going to see enormous progress in that area. Okay. So the last one I want to mention is he had an actionable plan. Okay. And now I have another point too, but first of all, I want, I want to mention this one. He had an actionable plan. Okay. So he had the goals, right? He had the, he had not the goals, but uh, not goals, but the goal rebuild the wall. And out of that, he had a plan. Okay. It wasn't just, you know, we'll, we'll just see and just everybody do their own thing. No, like he took leadership. Okay. He took responsibility to lead the people. It's a powerful thing that happens here because now he's super clear. And we read this last week, but I want to read it again. 
this is verse 17. He said, then I said to them, this is after he took time to assess the walls. He took three days. He wasn't in a hurry. He didn't share it with anybody. He didn't go telling 10 people. He didn't have a committee meeting about how we're going to make this happen. He just got super clear about what needs to happen. And he knew he had all the resources he needed to make it happen. And I'm going to tell you, so do you, because you have the Holy Spirit and you have access to all the resources of the kingdom to actually restore the walls of your life and carry out the mission that God has called you to carry out. Okay. Verse 17. Then I said to them, you see the distress that he says that we are in. He points it out. They could see it. How Jerusalem lies waste and its gates are burned with fire. Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer be re a reproach. I love that he, he identifies with them. And let me just say this again, he's talking about rebuilding the walls He's connecting that rebuilding to the reproach of the people, okay? So he's helping them to see that rebuilding the walls is going to remove the reproach that you yourself are experiencing and the people. And this is so important in anything that we do. God wants to help us see that connection that this thing that you're doing, that I'm asking you to do and how it connects to a much bigger plan, right? A much bigger vision. Okay. And I told them of the hand of my God, which had been upon me and also of the King's words that he had spoken to me. And then they said, let us rise up and build. And then they set their hands to this good work. Hallelujah. They set their hands to this good work. So they responded in agreement. They understood with clarity what it was they were signing up for, and they understood how it was going to help them. And this is what the Lord wants to do for us. If we will give him that time, and I have one more of these that I want to, I want to, one more point I want to share with you that's really important. But if we will give him that time to allow us to assess with him the the walls of our life the different relationships our relationship with him especially our relationship with others our um our finances our you know whether it's a career or the season of life you're in or um your your home your hobbies are you are you getting enough exercise you know um your health um are you um are you laughing i mean you know i mean all of these things right like some people they're just all focused and they're all work and no play right so i mean you begin assessing these walls of your life and and allowing the lord to show you where the rubble is where there's been um, neglect, where there's been um, um, maybe some things you've ignored. Maybe, so, you know, these people had been living in this for so long because they were hopeless. They just felt like, what can we do? We can't do anything. We can't rebuild these walls, right? But see, what the Lord wants to show us is that we can we can because he is going to resource us with everything we need to get the job done. Okay. Okay. So um, I want to, I want to share this with you too. Okay. Because in the very next verse, we see the enemy beginning to oppose him. Now, if you go back to verse 10, it says when Sam Ballot, the Horonite and Tobiah, the Ammonite officials heard of it, they were deeply disturbed that a man had come to seek the well-being of the children of Israel. Now, here's the thing. As soon as you begin to take steps to rebuild the walls around your life or take steps to begin to work on that vision, that mission that God has entrusted to you, you better believe the enemy is going to be disturbed by it because he knows he's always so much more aware of how the, the vision that God has for our lives is meant to impact the story of redemption for humanity. Like we're part of that story. He's very aware of that. So once we rise up and say, I'm not settling for this any longer. I'm not going to let this thing remain in rubble. I'm not going to continue to be okay with this thing being in neglect or disrepair. I'm not okay with this anymore. 
I am actually going to begin to believe God and begin to trust that this area of my life can, in fact, be rebuilt, that I am not relegated to living in this rubble and this mess for the rest of my days. I am going to trust God to do something magnificent in this area, something that is beyond my own ability, but not beyond God's ability. I'm going to trust him to help me rebuild, to, to build this vision or this mission that God has placed in my heart. Okay, I'm going to trust him and I'm going to begin to take steps of faith. Well, you better believe the enemy is going to rise to oppose you. Okay, now here's what he does. And I wrote this out, anticipate psychological warfare. You know what that is? That's in the mind, in the head, because the enemy is there to play head games with you and you need to be aware of his tactics. Okay, so in the next, in verse 19, chapter two, verse 19, it says, but when Sanballat, here's the same, same one, these are the enemies of the people of God in that day. It says, when Sanballat, the Horonite, Tobiah, the Ammonite official, and Geshem, the Arab, heard of it. They laughed at us and despised us and said, what is this thing that you are doing? Will you rebel against the king? Will you rebel against the king? Okay, I'm going to close this up in just a minute. So hang, hang tight with me for a second, okay? Because I want to point this out because... This, as soon as we begin to move in that direction, I just want you to be aware that the enemy is going to rise to oppose you. And I want you to be on to his tactics. So when you begin to step out, okay, what does it say? He says, they laughed at us. The enemy is going to try to make you feel foolish. Okay. He's going to try to make you feel foolish for even trying. He's going to, he's going to make you feel like it's a stupid errand. It's a fool's errand to even try. Okay. So you need to be aware of that. And he does it where he, he plays mind games with us. He, he engages us in psychological warfare. Okay. So you've got to be aware of where those thoughts are coming from. And they're so insidious many times, and, and they might come from people, you know, this is why you want to be cautious about who you're sharing with and you, and you don't want to share prematurely because you can actually expose yourself to, um, to trouble that's not necessary. Okay. So I'm not saying you shouldn't share with people, but I'm just saying you, you need to be cautious about who you share with and when you share with them. Okay. But also just know he, he can just come and accuse you in your own mind of being foolish. Okay. So that's one strategy of the enemy. The other one is it says here, um, and despised us. Well, you know, despise means to think of as worthless, unimportant, or not respected. And one of the things that often happens is when you rise up to do something that God is calling you to do, whether it's rebuilding the walls around your life or stepping into a mission assignment that God has given you, the enemy is going to make you feel despised, okay? He's going to make you feel um, not only foolish, but he's going to make you feel worthless. What do you have to contribute? Who do you think you are doing this, right? And he's going to make you feel unimportant. And many times he's going to have you experience things where you feel completely, maybe not completely, but very devalued and not respected. Okay. And I'm just going to say something here. Okay. Depending on where you're called, I know I'm a woman called into ministry and I, for one, in being in ministry for a lot of years, I can tell you that we, many times, depending on what God is calling you to do, we have to apply more effort in some ways to actually have that same respect that maybe a man in the same type of position would get. Okay. And I'm just being real. Okay. I'm just being real. And we have to be prepared for that. I know God has had to toughen me up. Okay. <laughs> he's had to strengthen my resolve. He's had, he's had to strengthen my arms in the battle. Okay. And he's had to help me walk through that process of recognizing and realizing I have to try, in a sense, tw twice as hard. Now, I know some people don't like that kind of phraseology, but it's just true. I have to, I have to watch my step and be above uh, the board 
like really like have to be extra, extra cautious because it's harder to garner the respect. And I'm going to say this even among other women, even among women. Okay. A lot of times. So sometimes, and this is just kind of the way the world is. And I, I think we, obviously we have a lot more freedoms and all of that as women. So this is not some kind of push for women's live or anything like that. We totally trust the Lord. Okay. And, and I can tell you, I'm the better for it. Okay. It, it's been like a refiner's fire in my life. But I just want you to be aware that this is one of the tactics of the enemy. And I think even as women, sometimes we can experience this even more so depending on where God is calling you. You kind of just have to be aware that you're going to get that kind of a pushback. We're not to be angry at people, but we are to recognize an agenda of the enemy. And we're going to come back at that by saying, Lord, I'm going to honor you. Lord, I'm going to trust you. Lord, I'm going to pray for people. Lord, I'm not going to be easily offended. Lord, I'm going to stand in my faith. Lord, I know what you've called me to do. And I'm trusting you to open the way at the in the right time, in the right moment. Okay. So this is this is important. And we as women. We want to rise to the call, okay? We don't want to be like the world. We're not going to do it like the world. We're going to show that we are able to handle the pressure because of Christ in us, amen? And that's going to draw out the gold. It's going to draw out the anointing, okay? And, and here's the thing. Every time the enemy does this kind of stuff, all it does is cause us to be even uh, or, or to emanate an even greater fragrance of Christ when we respond in the right way. Amen. And so I'm telling you, we don't want to be fearful of those enemies' attacks. We just know that God is going to work it for good, but we want to respond in the right way, a Christ honoring way, a way that we're trusting the Lord. But we also want to be prepared. It's coming. Okay. It's coming, whether we want it to or not. It's coming, okay? And so here's the last the last thing I'll mention um, that I noticed from this text too, okay? So it says they laughed at us, despised us. And then he says, what is this thing that you are doing? Will you rebel against the king? Many times when you step out to try to rebuild the walls of your life, make something better for yourself. You know what I'm saying? With the Lord, with the leading of God. Okay. I'm not talking about living in some totally selfish life, but I'm talking about rebuilding your life with the Lord to live a good quality of life or stepping out in the assignment of God to do this. You know what the enemy's going to tell you? He's going to tell you, no, you're really rebelling against what God wants you to do because God doesn't want you lifted up. That's just pride. That's just your pride speaking. That God doesn't want you doing this. That's just you. That's in your own head. Okay, this is what the enemy is going to tell you. This is what he said. What is this thing that you are doing? Will you rebel against the king? You need to be on to the tactics of the enemy. Jesus Christ paid a hefty price so that you and I could live in the fullness of what he paid for. OK, so you don't have anything to apologize to want to rebuild the walls around your life. You don't have anything to apologize for, to to rise up to the thing. Like like Paul said that um, we're going after everything that Christ purchased us for. Right. We're not we don't want to leave anything on the table. We want to rise up into all that he has already paid for. And your calling is part of that. Your calling is part of that. So the enemy will come to accuse you. But you need to stay focused on the word of God and being led by the Holy Spirit, okay? These are the things that God has for us. And I love that, um, let me just say this, in verse 6, chapter 4, verse 6, it says, So we built the wall, and the entire wall was joined together up to half its height for the people had a mind to work. And if I'm just, I'm just going to say something. And it, if you haven't done so yet, I just want to pop this up really quick. Excuse me. <clears throat> Excuse me. Make sure to type, let me remove this. Make sure to type in the chat, hashtag excellent, because I'm going to be giving, doing a giveaway in just a second. Okay. But let me just say this. We have to have a mind to work it. Okay. We got to work the truth. We got to walk in the truth. We got to, we got to trust the Lord. We got to be willing to put in the effort. One word that keeps being highlighted for me, diligence, be diligent, be determined, right? Like that's what they did. They had a mind to work. Once they had a vision, 
for what God wanted to do. And they realized we have all the resources we need. See, God wants to give you a vision that you have all the resources you need to accomplish this task. As daunting as it might seem, God says you are resourced for it, but you're going to have to have a mind to work. You're going to have to have a mind to be diligent. You're going to have to have a mind and heart to be determined because the enemy is going to come after you. Okay. But you don't, you don't even have, we're going to see, we'll talk about this more. Um, I'm not sure if it'll be next week or the week after, but we are going to talk about some of the ways that we see Nehemiah. Okay. Uh, just put the enemy off and put the enemy down. Okay. He doesn't let him interfere with any of it. It's a beautiful thing. A beautiful thing. Okay. So let's go ahead. So here's what we are. Let me see if I can find it really quick and I'll put it up. You want to put, um, yes, in the chat, you want to put excellent, hashtag excellent. Okay. So here's what we're, we're doing a drawing for tonight. Okay. This is a cutesy little, uh, there's two pages here and it's in Excel. I'm sorry. Yes. Um, excellent printable. It's for a um, prayer Bible study or just a planner or whatever, whatever you want to use it for. But they are so cute. There's two pages of them. And I just designed this because I was sharing at the beginning how um, my word for the year is excellent. So over the weekend, I created uh, this design for my planner. And um, anyway, so I'm just excited to be able to share that with you girls. So let me go ahead and pull this up. Uh, let me see, or actually, yeah, let me enlarge it if I can. And listen, if this has been helpful for you tonight, please be sure to hit that like button and, um, to let me know, I'm going to put this on full screen. Okay. So you can see it and let me, you guys have to uh, bear with me because I tend to lose control of my mouse. Let me see. Where are you? There we are. Okay. Here we go. So we have eight entries for the printable. Okay, here we go. Oh, okay, that's kind of funny. <laughs> okay, you know what? Uh, yes, David, you can have it if you want, but I'm going to actually, I'm going to do one more because um, I think we kind of want of a girl to win, even though we love brother David and we love him being here. <laughs> okay. So, uh, okay. Hold on a second. We're going to do it again. Let me see if I can type this back in. Oh yeah. Oh, sorry. Okay. I'm going to do it again. There we go. Let's do one more. I should make one for guys really. Right. Princess Madeira. Yay. Okay. So let's, for both of them, <laughs> let's go ahead and do a little, let's do a little hand clap in the chat for both of them. Amen. Okay. So, um, yeah. So, Hey, if you want one though, you can check it out in the description below this, um, video. It's in my little store. I just set that store up about a week ago. So I'm, it's, I'm kind of having fun with that, but, uh, Princess Madeira, all you have to do is email me at the number four, his beloved, um, at att.net. Okay. The, that's the number four, his beloved at att.net. Okay. And, um, yeah, somebody, Julia said, and this is a great idea. She said, David, maybe share it with a woman he knows might like the stickers. What a great idea. Yes. So David, you, you email me too. I'm going to give one to you as well, because you can always share it with somebody else. Okay. Um, so anyways, uh, yeah. So just, you're just going to email me the number four, his beloved at att.net. And then I will email you back. I'm not sure if I'll do it tonight or tomorrow morning. So you'll, you might be a little bit patient with that, but, um, I'll email you back the, uh, downloadable PDF. And I just print mine out on, on sticker paper. I have a silhouette portrait printer that I use to cut mine out, but you can actually cut those out pretty cute, pretty cutesy, um, on your own. So anyways, that was fun, right? Okay. So thank you so much, ladies and David, brother David, for joining us tonight for the study. I look forward to being back with you all again next week. And, um, 
hopefully you girls will be able to have some time to let the Lord assess your walls. I'm going to close this out in prayer in the name of Jesus. So Father, I thank you, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, I thank you, God, for your willingness, Lord, to do above and beyond all we could ask or imagine. I thank you, God, for all the resources of heaven that are available to us to do this great work so that your glory can be on display in our lives. And Lord, I pray for every one of my sisters and my brothers, whether they're watching now or on the replay, Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that a grand and glorious vision, the, the vision, God, that you have, that that good, godly, big vision, Lord, that you have for our lives would be revealed in even greater measure, Lord. I don't care what stage of life we're in, Lord, I already know you have so many good things for us at any and every every stage of life. So I pray, God, that our hearts would be infused with supernatural hope tonight because we're not looking to ourselves, we're looking to you. And I look forward, Lord, to all that you're going to do as we continue to trust you to rebuild the walls of our lives and to carry out the assignments that you've entrusted to us. In Jesus' mighty name, I pray, amen and amen. Okay, sisters, it's been wonderful. I bless you all in the name of Jesus. And I look forward to being back with you again next week. Okay, good night.